So today's session, Our Diversity Makes Us Great and Why America Needs Immigrants. So let's begin. Okay. Can you see that? Real Christians would be waiting at the border with food, water, clothing, and medical aid, not guns. Jesus was, wasn't neutral. He sided with the poor, the sick, and the immigrant. Be like Jesus. Last week, Sister Rachel reminded us that when it comes to welcoming and caring for the sojourner, the immigrant, asylum seeker, refugee, that we are called to be the hands and feet of Jesus. So let's begin today by reminding ourselves that Jesus himself was a refugee for a time. This is a artist rendering of Mary with young Jesus in exile in Egypt. You recall that Mary and Joseph were called to take their baby and escape to Egypt because of King Herod's plan to kill the infants in Bethlehem. Jesus himself was in exile. We've talked about the fact that the world is facing perhaps the greatest humanitarian crisis in history with the displacement of millions from their homes around the world due to climate change, wars, economic hardship, as well as religious and political persecution. And to exacerbate the problem, politicians here in America and in Europe are demonizing immigrants and refugees rather than focusing on practical solutions. Immigrants are poisoning the blood of America. Trump's rhetoric comes directly from Hitler's Mein Kampf. And while only 34% of Americans say that immigrants entering the country illegally today are poisoning the blood of our country, 63% of Americans disagree. Six in 10 Republicans, 61% agree with this statement, compared with 30% of independents and 13% of Democrats. White evangelical Protestants, 60% are the only religious group which in the, is in a majority that agree that immigrants entering the country illegally are poisoning the blood of the country. Fewer than half of white Catholics and only one third of white mainline evangelical Protestants and Latter-day Saints agree with this statement. The problem, of course, is that this rhetoric continues to be part of the campaign on the religious right, and the political right, where Trump According to uh, Robert Jones, and let me read this for you, uh, reporting on immigrants being less than human. He quotes that Trump talks about immigrants slitting the throats of housewives in their kitchens and raping young girls and promises mass arrests militarized encampments and deportation. His rhetoric has now moved fully into Nazi territory. He has called immigrants not human and refers to them as animals. It's also interesting to note how the propaganda campaign against immigrants has changed American attitudes over the past 10 years. 
In 2013, those who believed that immigrants here illegally should have a path to citizenship included 53% of the GOP, 64% of independents, and 71% of Democrats. The truth is, the real truth, how can you lie about them and claim they're eating our pets when the truth is they're hardworking, humble, God-fearing folks looking for a better way? And here's the, the statistics. Majority of Americans, 56%, say that immigrants living in the United States should be given a way to become citizens provided they meet certain requirements. Majority support for a pathway for citizenship has remained consistent since 2013, but the political divide, as I mentioned, is greater than ever. In 2024, that number has only increased among Democrats to 77%, but has dropped to 55% among independents and only 36% among Republicans. And now we have President Trump promising to round up millions of undocumented immigrants. J.D. Vance suggests that there may also be those here legally who could and should be caught up in that net and put in detention camps while awaiting deportation and that this would be okay. In the breaking news here, 47% of Americans, 79% of Republicans support this. 79% support putting undocumented immigrants into militarized encampments. Much like uh, we did with the Japanese, but even more chilling is to think, again, when you demonize a particular kind of people or race of people. Think about what happened in Germany in the 30s. That's what really is chilling. When Trump says that America is for Americans only, Hitler said the same thing. Germany is for Germans only, white Aryan Germans. Aryan. voting for Trump. They don't understand how we can warn They're looking at me like, what's wrong with you? I mean, what won't you do? Yeah, it, it is chilling that um, we don't learn from our history. The cost of deporting these immigrants would be devastating to the economy. That's what is not being reported. The financial impacts of deporting between 11 and 14 million people would cost us 315 billion in the short run and subtract 4% from the US gross economy. Not to mention that it would amount to a $1 trillion a year gone that immigrants are currently putting into the economy. And the loss of workers would cripple agriculture, construction, and the service industries, not to mention health care. Who would be taking care of the elderly and the sick in the nursing homes? Who would be washing the dishes and cooking your food in the restaurant or hotel? Who would be changing the beds The hurtful and hateful rhetoric about how immigrants are dangerous and poisoning our country is part of a right-wing conspiracy to convince us that our enemy is among us and has to be dealt with and expelled. For they are threatening our white privilege, our way of life, our future as a country. But the truth is just the opposite. 
These newcomers are not only enriching our lives with their presence, but they are providing us with the hope and promise of a better future. And why do I say that? Let's look at several factors. <clears throat> First of all, America needs immigrants in order to thrive. As you see from this slide, our native born birth rate has plateaued. We are now not even replacing ourselves. We are an aging population. More and more, we need foreign born workers. There are projections that indicate in the long term that immigration is a bigger contributor to the demographic growth and stability of our nation than ever in the past. Note that we are in a negative with zero or even low numbers of immigrants. You see from this chart, with zero immigration, we're going to be at a minus 32%. With low immigration, we're at a minus 4.3% population. With main immigration, we have 9.7 9 growth. With high immigration, we're at a 30.6% growth. <clears throat> Maine is kind of just sustaining what we currently have. Maintaining. Main immigration is maintaining which is what the Biden administration was currently trying to do by increasing the number of uh, visas, work visas that were needed to, to fill the jobs that are going unfilled. If you consider our population peaked in 2024 at 333.4 million and without immigration, it will only decline. And note, as I said, that we're with low, with low numbers, we're in the negative. Consider the impact this will have on the economy with fewer able-bodied workers and the strain that a growth in the need for elder care will put on the entire system. Brookings researcher William Frey suggests that the current and future national population growth will depend on continued healthy levels of in international immigration to this country. Second, we must not dismiss the important, importance of immigration to the economic health and future of our nation. Notice a major drop in immigration in 2020 for a couple of reasons. One is a pandemic closed down immigration services for months. People could not be processed. Secondly, the Trump administration slashed the number of permanent visas allowed per year from 700,000 to 30,000. The economic recovery began 20 to 21 the number of vacant jobs surged to the historic high of 12 million due to um, a lack of workers in the service industry, agriculture, healthcare, and construction. But in 2023, the number of immigrants entering the workforce uh, increased due to an acceleration of work permits that made a positive difference in the economy going forward. The National Chamber of Commerce indicates that the economic well being of the United States is on bringing more workers into this country. The inflow of foreign born workers, as I said, dropped significantly in 2020. And fortunately, it has increased and jobs are being filled. Keep in mind that the number of vacant jobs had surged to a historic high of 12 million, and the lack of migrant workers compounded the shortage, especially, as I mentioned, in construction, healthcare, agriculture, the service industry. But fortunately, because of the increased number, it's made a positive difference in the American economy. And even the Wall Street Journal reported, quote, 
the U.S. economy's prospect of a soft landing are getting a boost from an unexpected source, a historic rise in immigration. The inflow of foreign-born workers, which had slowed to a trickle, is now briskly rising briskly as the U.S. catches up on a backlog of visa applications and the Biden administration accelerates work permits. That's the story that is not being told. And that's, again, why we need to change the narrative. We need to tell the whole story. And third, immigration. Immigration has not only been important in responding to the job growth in this country, but it is also an economic driver. The contributions of immigrants in the U.S. economy According to the U.S. Budget Office, over the next decade, immigrants will generate $7 trillion boost to America's gross national product. In 2022, even undocumented households paid $46.8 billion in federal taxes, $29.3 billion in state and local taxes, $22.6 billion in Social Security, $5.7 billion to Medicare. Do you want to wipe that out of the U.S. economy? According to the Congressional Budget Office, over the next decade, immigration will generate a $7 trillion boost to America's gross national product. Migrant families, documented and undocumented, continue to contribute to the government coffers in large amounts. And finally, Let's put an end to the argument that immigrants and refugees are taking native-born jobs. And I like this. If someone with no education who can't speak English is able to walk across the border and take your job, we need to have a serious conversation about you upgrading your job skills. And as we said, uh, I think in my first lecture, most of these immigrants coming in are not taking high paid skilled jobs. They start at a very low level. Um, we have several reasons why this is not happening. I want to show you one more slide. In the center, we have a CEO of a large company, perhaps, or a politician. You can, you can guess whoever that is with a large plate of cookies. And the American worker has one cookie. And uh, the gentleman in the middle is saying, careful, that foreigner wants your cookie. But that is, again, the narrative that we're hearing. And one of the reasons that's not true is that we have the lowest unemployment rate in history with jobs going wanting. And secondly, economists say that even people who are here illegally are not taking jobs from the native born because those immigrant workers are often, again, as I said, taking the jobs the U.S. born workers are unwilling to fill. A 2023 Wall Street Journal poll asked respondents if they believed the American dream was still true. And only 30% said yes, 36% said yes. And yet a majority of Latinos, 60%, said they can still achieve the American dream. In 2024, Latino poll indicates that 94% believe that hard work and an ability to speak English will enable them to succeed. Many of these newcomers believe that if they work hard, they learn how to speak English, then they can succeed. They find themselves, most of them in menial jobs, such as agriculture, 
construction, housekeeping, dishwashing, food processing, nursing home aids, and so on. And the reality is that in the coming decades, we are going to need more and more of these types of workers to keep the US economy growing and to fill these essential jobs. They also see this for themselves as a starting point for them to provide for their families and to make a better life for themselves and for their communities. At the same time, we also need to import some of the best talent in medical and digital technology if America is to continue to make advances in those fields. And I'm talking about uh, individuals who are highly skilled from India, from China, other place, Korea, other places around the world, that they can have visas to come in and participate in the innovation that this country is so well known for. The innovation, particularly in the areas of digital and medical technology. We have been a nation of immigrants who have come to the shores hoping for a better life bringing their different cultures, their beliefs, their gifts to make America what it is, a rich tapestry of diversity. And because of that, we are still a nation of promise and possibilities. And so what about the American dream? Is it still alive and well? Well, most of the newcomers to this country would agree with that. Consider, for example, Ki Hu Quan, who was born in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. He immigrated with his parents to the United States and became a child actor. He rose to fame playing short round in Indiana Jones and in, in the Temple of Doom and data in the Goonies, which is one of my two sons' favorite films. He received an Academy Award for Best Actor in a Supporting Role for the movie Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, which happens to be a parody about our immigration system. It's a, an interesting film. Accepting the award with tears of joy, he shared these words. My journey started on a boat. I spent a year in a refugee camp, and somehow I ended up here on Hollywood's biggest stage. They say that stories like this only happen in movies. I cannot believe it's happening to me. This is the American dream. I want to close with just a couple of slides. When you demonize the immigrant, the poor, and the marginalized, I'm not interested in hearing about your religious beliefs, says Reverend Benjamin Kramer. For you've already shown me what they are by how you're treating the immigrant, the poor, and the marginalized. And this is a yard sign, love, not hate, is what makes America great. And finally, this is our America. At least this is the America that I think most of us aspire to, where all people have value, that love always wins, kindness is free, Beliefs are personal, rights are, un are universal. Freedom only exists as if it applies to everyone. Choose to be curious, not judgmental. The world is full of friends that we have yet to meet. Our differences make us beautiful and we can all strive to be good humans. Let's have some conversation. We have a few minutes.
questions or comments? Please. You have an answer to that. Why? Why is is some of what you were, are telling us about, and then, and then you'll say, and this isn't reported. It's you know this is. It's not being widely reported. I mean, if you if you're reading the right um, magazine or the right newspaper, um, or you're you're reading Heather Cox Richardson. Uh, her blog post, you know, you'll you'll see some of this, you know, but it kind of gets hidden, even with the um, Wall Street Journal. I mean, it might be a you know an article on the back page. Um, you know, I think what's the problem here is that most uh, news media, and I'm including not just the conservative, but they tend to report what's what's sensational. They don't report the whole story. Also, a lot about immigration, but she hasn't talked about what you shared with us about what they're bringing. Which I think is a mistake. Yeah. I should send her a copy of my book. So that's, you know, that's very well out there. Financial Times. New York Times, those it's all out there. The problem is that people don't read that. They're, you know, so that's what I'm saying. That, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm saying. It's it's yeah. out there, but it's it's not in the in the wider media necessarily. Uh, and and it's true that it's not being reported. Uh, I think that I think that's one of the mistakes. Maybe that people on the the uh, in the Democratic Party are not giving the whole story. That's a big deal. The population decline in Western Europe right now that they're dealing with. Yep. yep. Italy is the prime example. And yep. Scandinavia. Right. Yeah, that's just, yeah, I mean, I read Paul Krugman in the New York Times. I mean, he, he has this message out there yeah. over time like that and so on. But, but the majority of people are not reading the New York Times. I don't yeah. know how to get it. I mean, even just right now, the the difference between Europe and the U.S., okay, is that in the recovery from the pandemic, I mean, Europe is getting about the same way the U.S. was in, in 2020 and, and throughout the pandemic, but they haven't recovered their economy nearly as much as the U.S. has. And the only really plausible explanation of that is the additional immigration that the U.S. has had over the European countries. And I mean, it's uh, it's one of the rare natural experiments you can get in economics, okay, to uh, to see something like right, that. Right. Right. Please. I did say first my own personal experience. I was an elementary school teacher in Everett for thirty years, and I taught mostly in really low income schools. And when the big immigration waves began, you know, I just remember all of these groups that came, the kids were so ready to wait, to learn. The parents were amazingly supportive. The little Vietnamese girl that said, yeah, and when we had to leave, we threw all our gold in the river so the communists wouldn't get it and ran. Yeah. The uh, little uh, Russian girl whose mom sat in the back of the kindergarten class to become more fluent in English, and we were really open to that. We had lots of mom who took that. Uh, and she was a dentist in Russia. And the next time I you know, was acquainted with her, she was a she was bag gal at Safeway. And the last I heard, she's a dental hygienist now. So she she took that skill she worked at. And everyone I worked with, all of the kids were just ready. The parents are supportive. One of the Iraqi girls says, my dad wants to move back to Iraqi, but mama won't go. Yeah. <laughs> I can see your point. <laughs> Well, that's a good. You have to have that relationship to see how hard these people are working and what they're willing to do. What they, yeah, you know, so many families, what they gave up to come here for freedom, for opportunity. Many of them begin 
escaping persecution, escaping war, whatever. And the fact that they are willing to learn, and, and I know, uh, Aaron, what you're going to say, I think, that the, the schools, you know, they've been inundated with all these children of all these, from all these different languages. How many languages are now being 30 some languages now in the public schools? And yet their eagerness to learn, to get ahead, to start over again, if they need to. But these are people that love America, that are here because they had to come, some, you know, go someplace to find a safe home for their families. And they're willing to work hard and to contribute to their communities. These are, you know, God's children, aren't they? Uh, who are among us. And we're all, as we said the first session, you know, we're all children of immigrants. I've sat on several different scholarship boards statewide. And what's coming to the forefront is these children have been brought here and the parents have told them, we're here for a better life for you. And you look at the kids who are applying for the scholarships, who are putting in the work, who are, if you look at the awards that are given every June when they graduate, look at the ones that get the department scholar in all the different school districts. I bet they're all native immigrants from a foreign country, recent immigrants, because the kids know that's their path to success. This is what's going to happen if you put in the work. That's their path to a new future. One more comment, and then we're going to need to break. No. And last year, we've been hearing about uh, the challenges that we're confronted with in the U.S. and our society and here in Everett, whether it be Native American immigration uh, within our faith community with, you know, white Christian nationalism. And about six months ago, I was sitting in here with you all, and uh, at the end, Somebody made the comment, I don't remember what it is, about how um, uh, frustrated and depressed they were about the situations that we've been talking about. And out of that one comment, a thought, a thought popped into my head. I wonder what James would have to say about that to us. <laughs> so, Starting next <laughs> Sunday. <laughs> Commercial time. Um, we're all of one faith, one grace, and one word. And that's exactly who James is speaking to. And so I encourage you to bring your wisdom with you as you share as teachers. And we all have different calls. As Sister Rachel did last week in her call. In fact, I I would encourage you to listen to her again. It was amazing. And let's have that discussion about here we sit in this room with our community and look in about what now we must do in our home. Thanks, Phil. So the conversation can continue next week. Thanks so much for today and have a good week. Thank you.